In this video, I'm going to give you a demonstration of how you actually set up and use an address locator for geocoding for a single field, in this case for postal codes. Okay, so here I am in ArcMap, and I've got some data over here that I'm going to use for geocoding uh, inside my geodatabase. So I have my fast food postcodes there, and I've got my reference data for postcodes for all of Toronto uh, there. So that's what I'm going to use. So first I'm going to set up my service, then I'm going to actually use it. So all you have to do to set up an address locator is right click on the folder where you want to put it and say new address locator. That's all there is to it. So here's the dialog box for our address locator. And the first thing it's going to ask me for at the top of this dialog box is the style, then the reference data, and then the fields that those reference data uh, are going to use, and then where we want to put this output uh, address locator. So we have our style, our reference data, the fields for that reference data, and then where we want to put the output. Those are the main components to setting up any address locator. So I'll just click on the button here to set a style. And you'll notice that there's different styles available. For what I'm doing here, all of the data that I'm going to use for my reference data, and that's going to be in the event table is going to be in one column. So typically a postal code or a zip code will just be in one field. And so all the style is doing is telling the software to look for event table data that will be in one field. So I'm just going to select single field. You'll notice there's different ones here for different types of data, for street data, whether it's in one range or two ranges and so on. For now, we'll just keep it simple. We'll just do a single field and click OK. Now don't get freaked out by the fact that there's now an error associated with this. That's okay. I'm not sure why it does it. I mean, it's just flagging to you that this locator is not finished yet, that you need to set some other parameters in order for this to work properly. So don't be alarmed if you see a little error sign like that. So we've told it what style to use. Now we're going to tell it what reference data we want to use. So click on the button here. and I'll specify post, postal codes underscore Toronto underscore point. So that's just the name of the reference data that I'm using here. That's all of the postal codes for the entire city of Toronto. I will click add. And so now it's listed here, the reference data that I've specified. So that's the data that I wanted to use, but it's still, there's this little uh, error here because what this part is for is to say, which fields in that reference data do you want me to use or does the software want to use to make those matches to the event data? The most important thing here is the key field. That's the field that you're trying to match to the event data. So if I click on that, and I'll say, in this case, it could be post underscore code. Now, why do I have this in here twice? Because in Canada, we have the six digit postal code, and often it will be shown with a space between the first three digits and the last three, the FSA and the LDU, but sometimes it won't. It will, they'll have them smushed together without the, the space. And so with this reference data set, they've actually provided it in both formats so that you can uh, use it either way. So I'm going to go with post code, uh, post underscore code, which has the spaces for it. And we say, okay, I'm not gonna uh, specify anything else. And so when I do that, you'll notice that the error has now disappeared. Things have been set up correctly. I've told it it's a single field. I've told what reference data I wanna use. I've specified the key field for that reference data and I'm going to specify where I want the output to go. So the output address locator, I'm going to just put here and just call it Toronto underscore postal codes. It's always a good idea to just use underscores instead of spaces. There are times in ArcGIS where spaces are allowed, but generally, uh, there's lots of places where they're not allowed, so just to be on the safe side, I tend to not use spaces, I'll use underscores instead. Okay, so that's all we have to do. I'm going to click OK. The address locator is now being generated by the software. It's working on it. You can see the little status bar down in the corner there. And what's happening here is that it's going through and sort of processing, sifting, sorting, however you want to think of it, all of that reference data. And so for Postal Codes for Toronto, there are thousands and thousands of them, and it's going through and, and setting that up so that it can be used as a service. So now you'll see that once the geocoding process has been set up, that we have an entry here, 
with a little house icon that indicates that it's an address locator. It's got the name that I specified. And so that's now a customized tailored service that I've created to be able to geocode postal codes for the city of Toronto. Now that we have our address locator set up for postal codes for Toronto, let's see how we actually use it. Okay, so I have a fast food postal codes data set here. Now I want to point out one thing here is that you'll see from that icon for the one I've selected there that that's a table that's inside a geodatabase. But because it has a table icon, what that's indicating is that it's not in its present form mappable. That's the way I always think of it, is that there are no uh, coordinates associated with it. If there were, if there were actually points, it would have a different little icon next to it. What this is telling me is that it's an attribute table. So when you're, in other words, what I'm trying to say is when you're trying to map an event table, it could be in a text file or a CSV file or an Excel file. There's lots of different formats you could be in. It just so happens one of those that is that it could be inside a geodatabase. That doesn't automatically mean that it's already a GIS file. It just means that it's a table stored inside a geodatabase. Okay, just want to make sure that's clear. So the first thing I'm going to do is add my event table to ArcMap. I can just do that by dragging and dropping this onto the map itself. It's not actually going to map it though because it's not a mappable format. What it will do though is list it over here. So you may notice that it's automatically switched to the data view because this is not a file format that's mappable in itself. It'll say, oh, well, maybe you want to be able to see that. So let me just make sure this is clear is if I switched over to the uh, view by layer, what's mappable, let me just clear that out there. You'll see that there's no uh, table listed there because it's not something that, that can be shown on the map yet. But if I go to the data view, you'll see that it is there. Okay, so let's open that up and see what it looks like. So here's the attribute table for my events. You'll see that because it's being stored inside a geodatabase, ArcMap has assigned each of these an object ID. That's really just a way for the software to be able to keep track of each individual entry. For us, generally, normally, you can ignore that. The next column is the name, and the next column is the postcode. This is my event table, so now we're going to geocode it. So in order to do that, I'm just going to right-click on my event table and say geocode addresses. Don't be uh, confused by the fact that it says geocode addresses. I'm not sure why they set it up that way. I guess they had to call it something. It just means you're going to geocode something based on a locator service. Um, so it could be postal codes, whatever. That's just the generic term that they're using here. So don't get confused by that. All right. So you'll notice that when I'm looking at the selection here, these are address locators that are built into Esri, that, uh, things like the Esri World Geocoder. So those are using an online service. This is something completely separate that Esri has set up automatically. But what we're going to use here is the one that we've created, which is Toronto underscore postal codes. And I just have to tell it that that's the one I want to use and click OK. So then we'll see a dialog box here. And it's specifying that, OK, this is the table that I want to map. Um, is it asking me if I want to use multiple fields or single fields, what key I want to use, and that it's going to create a static snapshot and where I want to put that, okay? And I'm going to pick post code. So that's the column that has the actual postal codes in it. That's the key that we want to use for that. It's going to create a static snapshot of this table inside a new feature class. So what that means is it's going to just go into that, geocode it once, create an output, and that's it. It's not dynamic, it's not updating this in real time, nothing fancy like that. It's just a static snapshot. So I've specified the output for this. So it's going to be in my Z file, or Z drive, in my geocoding geodatabase. I've just called it fast underscore food. I'm going to use the defaults for the rest of it, and click OK. So that was quick. It's not a huge data set, so it didn't take that long. And so what this is showing me is how many match. So we had 57% match. We had 43% that were tied, and we had 1% that were unmatched. And it told me that the average speed for this was 869,000 records per hour. Wow. I'm always kind of amused by the fact that they show this. I guess if you're doing really large data sets, it would matter what the speed is. But for me, I think that's probably fast enough. So sometimes you'll see results like this. In other words, you might be a little disappointed that the match rate isn't a little bit higher. That's okay. 
you know, uh, geocoding can be a bit of a messy process. If you're dealing with data that people have entered by hand, especially, you know, it could be collected by someone who's a cashier at a grocery store, for example, who's got other things to do other than type in postal codes. So it's possible that they've made a mistake as they're trying to, you know, check people through. It could be that the, a customer gave them uh, a fake postal code that doesn't really exist, so that's not going to match. Uh, there's lots of reasons why it may not match correctly. So uh, don't be discouraged by that. You're not going to get 100% right away by any means. Um, if you get something like 70, 89%, consider that to be pretty good. I could just accept the results as they are, or I can click the rematch button and have a closer look. The interactive rematch dialog box gives us a chance to go through the results and look at the things that didn't match properly and see if there's a way for us to fix them. So you'll see here at the top, this little box here shows the results that uh, did or did not match. So for example, we've got one here that is uh, got a status of U, meaning that it's unmatched. And why is it unmatched? Well, it's got a score of zero. So what that means is when it's going through, it's trying to figure out how closely does something match. And it'll give it a score between zero and 100. So for example, if you had a street address where uh, the name was off by one letter or something like that, it might get a score of say uh, 80, 90. And so you could go through and get a sense of, well, how close was it? But if you're getting a zero, it means it didn't match at all. So let's see why that might be. If I keep scrolling to the right here, you'll see that we've got things like X and Y, it's all blank because nothing matched properly. And if we go all the way over to the match address, you'll see that it's blank. And so what that tells me is that there's something missing in that record. And let's have a look at the actual uh, resulting table. So here's the, the results. So you'll see that there's different columns. So for example, we have things like status, which is you know M for match, T for tie, uh, U for unmatched. We can have uh, different scores here. There's a bunch of information uh, available to us. But what's notable is that the match address, the thing that it was actually trying to match, in this case, was blank. And so, whoops, if we keep scrolling over here, you'll see that that was for Wendy's Restaurants of Canada. So for some reason, that didn't get entered at all. If we go through and look, there may be some more. There's another blank one. So there's a couple of blank ones. So that's an obvious reason why it didn't get uh, matched correctly. Overall, though, we've done pretty well. You'll see that there's a lot of scores that are 100. We've got some ties here. And uh, let's have a look at what that might mean. If we go back to our dialog box here. We can ask it to just list the ties. So that's unmatched. Let's look at the ones that are tied. Unmatched with candidates tied. Actually, there's nothing unmatched. So let's look at matched with candidates tied. And you can see here that, that what this probably means, and that's exactly what's happened, is that there's multiple entries in the reference data for the same postal code. So in other words, for whatever reason, when that reference data was created, somebody entered that same exact same postal code with uh, the same coordinates three different times. And this is just a way for the software to flag that and say, well, I just matched it to one of them. You may want to have a look at it to make sure that all three of them are the same, which you should do. It's possible uh, when someone was creating this that maybe they didn't put them in the same location. Often, uh, you know, this kind of data entry is really tedious. People get tired. They might make mistakes. So depending on how careful you want to be about this, you may want to go through and, and double check those kinds of things. But essentially, this is the process that you go through. You look at the ones that didn't match. You see whether they're uh, unmatched, tied, what the score was. You look at the candidates to see if there's anything that you can fix. Sometimes you have to go back and look for new data, like I said, if there's uh, ones that are missing. Or you may just accept the fact that you may not be able to match all of them and go ahead with the ones that you do have. We'll close this for now. And now we can see that our points have actually been mapped. These are our fast food locations based on postal codes. So do remember that they are only mapped as precisely as the postal code reference data allows. And what I mean by that is that it's able to get it down to a certain level of, of precision, but that's it. So that might be, in this case, the full six digits for the postal code, but that's for that particular delivery area, not down to a specific household. So that's basically it. That's geocoding using a single field, uh, setting it up with the style, the reference uh, data, setting up the address locator, and then being able to use it by uh, inputting our event table and then getting our output here that we have as our result.